Good morning, everyone. My name is Mahnoor. I'm the Marketing Communications Manager at XIQ, and I'm pleased to host you today. Thank you for joining our webinar, How is AI Transforming B2B Marketing? Today, we've got Lois Mueller, Marketing Strategist at XIQ, who will be talking to Kabul Shah and Osman Sheikh to tell us how AI is transforming the B2B marketing landscape. It's going to be an exciting discussion, and I hope you enjoy and share the insights. I'm gonna run through the housekeeping before we begin. We'd love to hear from you during today's presentation. If you have a question, please feel free to send it through the Q&A channel at the bottom of your player. We'll be answering your questions at the end of the session. Today's webinar will be available on demand after the live session and is accessible through registering on the website. Lastly, we'd encourage you to share this webinar with your social networks. With that, I'd like to kick things off by handing it over to our moderator. Hi, Louise. Thank you for being here. Please begin. Thank you very, very much. Hello, everyone. As 2020 comes to a close, albeit it might feel like a rather slow close, B2B marketers should no longer be asking if AI can help their business grow, but instead for 2021, how can you leverage AI to grow your business? AI is acting as a force multiplier to enhance B2B marketing capabilities, and today we will be learning from the pros. We have two B2B sales and marketing leaders joining us who will share their personal experiences with AI in B2B marketing, Kabil Shah and Usman Sheikh. Kabil is the Global Marketing Director at Nutanix, where his role includes looking after worldwide executive programs, ABM, and global accounts marketing. He has 20 years in the technology industry in roles ranging from marketing and sales to industry practices at companies such as SAS, VMware, and Oracle. Usman Sheikh is the founder and CEO of XIQ, who prior to founding XIQ was the vice president in multiple global roles at SAP, including digital commerce, sales enablement, and product management. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today. I appreciate you taking the time to be here. Absolutely, pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me, Lois. Good morning. Uh, for joining us and Chloe, it's good to have you moderating the conversation. Thank you. Well, let's begin. So since you both are at the forefront of sales and marketing technology, I want to start by asking, how do you define AI in the context of B2B marketing? Okay, so maybe you want me to kick off, Lois? That would be great, yes. Yeah, okay, sure. So um, not to sound cheesy, but I think I think we, we use the term artificial intelligence, right, um, a lot. And I feel it's not fake, it's not artificial, it's, it's actually synthetic intelligence because what we're doing is we're using it um, to target people more efficiently and using information and data in a way that we haven't been able to in the past. So for me, AI by itself or OSI is, is, is not enough. I think there's other pieces to it. I think there's a convergence of different technologies coming together. So you have AI, you have machine learning, you have big data, you have IoT, 5G, all these things converge um, to really impact the, the marketing process, right? The, the real targeting of individuals, both at an account level and at a persona level. Um, and that's where I think, you know, artificial, artificial intelligence combined with those other technologies is really giving marketing and sales a real edge in, in the uh, in the industry, right? From building in you know ideal customer profiles, those people who, who follow ABM, um, you know, using all the customer buying behaviors, propensity to purchase, all that fantastic stuff using predictive analytics, you can now do that at the individual, and that's something we haven't been able to do before. Um, so I think those that, that's that's kind of my open gambit, if you like. That's what I think of uh, of AI. Um, and kind of a real world example, and then obviously I, I want to hear from the expert who's just fine, but a, a real world example right now is if you look at old school marketing and sales, you know, there's something happening in the US right now uh, around an election. Um, and you see, you know, polling and, and pollsters giving uh, predictions around what's going to happen, right? Using sentiment and, and going out and doing surveys and, and that type of thing. Um, 
And I think the piece that's missing from that intelligence or that insight or prediction is really triangulating the different data sources, right? And putting them through predictive models. What do people watch? Where do people go? What networks are they part of? Who's the biggest influencer in their network, right? Because when you use data in that form, you know, using machine learning and artificial intelligence, I think you start to see things a little bit different and you can make a real impact in terms of what you're doing with marketing. Um, so I hope that made sense, but that, that's kind of what I think around overall AI in, in, in B2B marketing. Yeah, I agree. Um, to build on that, um, the way I define AI is by calling it augmented intelligence. And augmented intelligence is, is essentially an extension of what you said, that to understand your prospect, to understand your potential buyer, to understand your account, you need to be able to collect intelligence. You need to be able to connect the dots and make sense out of that. And having machine learning algorithms that can actually learn, continuously self-improve, and make better predictions in helping and augmenting the intelligence that's required to execute B2B marketing and sales is a 24 seven perpetual cycle that's going on. Um, so my experience in the past, which is what led me to create SA XIQ is at SAP. And having worked with some of the frontline best technology sales teams, what we saw were problems falling in classically into two buckets, Kabil. One, I would classify as that of, there was an inconsistent informational gap, right? Not knowing something had changed. I got on a flight in San Francisco to go to New York. A company had been acquired. I landed and I could not talk about the, the competitive landscape had changed, right? Oh, so that, yeah. and that's, that's a very you know, a delicate one, but there are much bigger gaps in informational gaps that reside, especially in frontline sales. Second thing was the behavioral connection, right? The emotional connection that's required. It, Gabil, you know, you know this, you've been reading all the reports. Um, the CB Insights, you know, cites that 84% of deals are lost because sales reps and marketing teams are not there with the right information at the right time to engage their clients, right? Yeah. Um, missed opportunities. So those were the two big gaps. And to fill these gaps, the most obvious thing was to be able to leverage machine learning to be able to create this augmented intelligence. The third thing, and this, this kind of trend transpires our COVID days, right? Which is that work from home or remote work or the boundaries of you know, time and the work week had kind of blurred. It's a 24 seven life cycle. Things are happening all, all the time. And you as B2B sales teams that are chasing big multi-million dollar deals, um, long sales cycle, multiple buyers, you've got to be having these teams and marketing teams on the subject of today, present and talking and ready today. That's what creates differentiation. So um, Lois, coming back to the question, which is what is AI in the context of B2B marketing? For me, it's this ability to have to augment, you know, as Kabil said, you know, the unstructured data resides, right? There's a lot of unstructured data residing across systems, but to be able to make sense and make sense in a timely fashion uh, and present it in a usable manner, that's really what the different, what differentiates, right, Kabil? What would you uh, say? 100%, I, I would agree with that. I think sometimes people don't take the care to understand the structured and um, structured data. Right. People then think they're driving business intelligence, but what they're actually driving is business stupidity. Because if you're getting data that's coming in and giving you the wrong, uh, you know, the wrong insights, or you're gleaning the wrong insights, that can be very dangerous and lead you to the wrong path. Right. Your your example of jumping on a plane and then the company's been acquired, you know, pre-COVID. That I mean, that's a that's happened to a lot of salespeople, right? Or turning up to to meet an individual in a completely different. Uh, to what you expected and not having that um, understanding of who the account is and who the buyer is, right? I think those two things um, are very powerful components in a, in a new AI outreach in B2B marketing. Absolutely. Yeah, let, let me just ask one more question. So the interpersonal relationship between buyer and seller, 
um, what value do you think would would you place on that, Kabil? In terms of like, do you think that being able to relate at a personal level with your prospect and client and speak in a manner um, helps the marketing and the seller move the bar? Absolutely. I mean, it's it's not it's not rocket science, right? If you understand an individual and you kind of know whether they're a dominant person or an influential person and how they like to be marketed to by utilizing their kind of their digital footprint and how they interact with content you send them or interactions you've had, I think you can make it a lot more powerful, right? I mean, one of the reasons we're talking today is because I had a, a person on my team running the, the US ABM um, and, and she was more of a dominant nature and she received uh, a matador talking about the influence of, of marketing, a visual image, which was very different to the one I received, which was of an orchestra, right? So you can see just two of us receiving a different message. And then if you scale that to thousands and thousands of people, I feel, I feel that being able to relate to people, I mean, we still sell to people is one of the most important things, right? Even in COVID, even via, via this WebEx that we're doing now, right? This, uh, this Zoom call, sorry. Um, you know, relating to people is one of the most important things, I feel, in a sales cycle or, or even in a, in a marketing program, right? 100%. Well, gentlemen, from those answers, I, I got a little bit of insight how we talked about unstructured data, the time constraints and how the nature of business is now turned to 24-7. And those could be perceived as challenges to some individuals. So what I'd like to ask next is what are the key challenges that you find with B2B marketing? And Kabil, we can start with you. Sure, thanks, Lois. Challenges, okay, how long do we have? <laughs> so, um, okay, so I think one thing I touched upon there was, you know, utilizing insight and, and structured and unstructured data. I think the other thing I would talk about is speed, right? Speed to market. Um, the amount of information going out to people today um, is just growing exponentially, targeting. Every time I look at my LinkedIn, I have like 200 LinkedIn emails, right? Um, and I think that's one of the biggest challenges. How do you put stuff together that resonates with that individual, right? How, I mean, it's not changed so much from, from previous, but you know, in a timely, relevant format, right? That, that person wants to get that information. And, and when we talk about speed to market, I was, I was lucky enough to spend some time with a professor at Columbia. Um, I'm gonna plug him actually, Dr. Art Langer, if you get a chance to read some of his stuff around digital disruption and marketing, it's pretty powerful. Um, and he talks about speed to market and everyone's probably seen this slide as marketeers, right? How long did it take to reach 50 million users for um, radio, it was, it was kind of like 40 years. For television, it was 15 years. For uh, the internet, it took five years. And then you had Instagram, two and a half years, Twitter, six months. So the speed of change and to reach to customers is, is just so fast. And you really have to understand what you're putting in front of them. And one of the things that's completely changed that is it took 19 days. Maybe you guys can guess this. Uh, to get to 15 million users or customers for a product or a, or a game called Pokemon Go, right? It got to 50 million users that quickly. I mean, it, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty fast. Um, so I think marketeers are having to work out how do we work in that speed and make sure we're still sending relevant, timely information to people that really resonates. So I think those, those, are, those are some of the things I think about. I also think about the culture in the company. Um, you know, marketeers have had, you know, segmented roles. Someone runs events, someone does digital, someone does a, a different um, aspect of marketing, marketing operations. I think that's, that's starting to converge as well. And I think individuals have to be able to take on different roles, have a better understanding of digital, have a better understanding of event management, have a better understanding of operations and spend and investment. Um, and not have these uber segmented roles within marketing. So I think the challenge there, and it's, it's, it's an opportunity, right? It's an opportunity for marketeers to learn um, and really hone their skill sets in areas that they might not have before. So I, I would say those, those two things, speed and efficiency and learning new techniques in this time would be key right now, Lewis to, Lewis to me. Kusman, do you concur with that? Absolutely. Um... Yeah, I, I, um, in terms of challenges, 
um, I, you know, I would absolutely, you know, business models have changed, right? So the way we were uh, going to market and selling technology, you know, we have a lot of people from the technology industry on the, um, sorry, uh, oops, shouldn't have done that. Um, I have a lot of people uh, from the technology industry uh, on this call today. And, uh, and, and, you know, the way we went to market uh, in the past has very rapidly involved. And it's the cloud and the SaaS business models that have kind of enabled the rapid change. You know, I think you were mentioning earlier in one of our discussions about shifting over to a subscriber-based economy, right? So yeah. going and selling physical versus, and I have, you know, I was at SAP when this whole transition from enterprise systems was taking place and cloud was becoming the, the, the new kid on the block and moving things around and that continued, right? That evolution continues. So that's a big challenge. And, uh, and, 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 you know, this, this, um, this living, breathing enterprise that's constantly churning out lots of information that we have to respond to and the information gap that it's creating is a huge challenge. I think that's, uh, um, that stays, uh, you know, at, at the forefront. And, and, you know, what we talked about earlier, and you concurred that in-person meetings and the ability to build that interpersonal relationship, you know, now um, all of a sudden it has almost been forced that we are separated that yeah. we are across digital screens, right? That we cannot have breakfast together. We cannot strategize in an office. I can't use a whiteboard to kind of plan out things with you, right? I can't. Yeah. All the tools that were available to me in the physical world to transition that across into the virtual world and then establish a relationship, right? So that's just compounded. It's, um, that's accelerated, I think, Abil, and compounded the uh, the problem, right? Which is it's been it's been happening. You know, we've been working from home, remote work. People have become we're much more used to being on Zoom in the enterprise world now because we've been doing it for five, six, seven, eight, nine years, yeah. right? So it already. So it's, however, there are certain aspects of business that were still in person and sales was very much in B2B, that in-person part of the business. Absolutely. Model, speed, new channels, and the ability on how you engage with individuals, this creates the new evolutionary drivers, right? Which is like, how do I engage across this physical chasm that I have, right? I can't meet you. Right? That's good. So how do I engage you? Absolutely. Yeah, Suman, I think, um, I think that, you know, you hit the nail on the head. I think COVID's had a lot of disruption and I feel I feel one of the things we've been trying to do differently um, at Nutanix is obviously uh, we, we've started a, a training center of excellence for, for our marketeers, right, for them to learn those new disciplines. Um, and, and one of them is targeting people in this new post-COVID uh, situation, right, because there's so many people that are being invited to Zooms. I think people are getting like Zoom, Zoom hangovers, right, the amount of time you spend on calls and and we might have reduced travel, but we've, we've got so much into, hey, hit someone with an email, hit someone with a LinkedIn mail, bring someone to a Zoom and have some, someone come and talk. And, you know, you lose some of that, um, that relationship, you know, that, that kind of setting that you have where you can have closed door conversations. And some of the challenges is how do you recre recreate that in, in today's world, right? How do you create that synergy? How do you create that energy? How do you keep people motivated, both on the, you know, on the employee side as well? And that, and that, those are things that, you know, keep people really thinking, right? Are we, are we keeping a positive outlook on how we're outreaching and all those types of things? So, yeah, I, I think, I think people are getting a little bit zoomed out, but I, I, I feel, I feel. In, in that there is there's there's a chance to do things differently whether that's train and and support your internal teams or whether that's to try new ways of engaging people right um, so yeah so definitely I think it's a, it's an opportunity in some ways 
Well, great. Gentlemen, with the conversation you both just had, my next question almost doesn't even need an introduction because you talked about it from the challenges, but I will ask it anyway. How do you feel B2B sales and marketing is evolving? And Kabil, we can start with you. Yeah. <laughs> I keep feeling like I'm taking over. I'm like, no, you're our guest, so please. Hey, thank you. Sorry. Okay. So, um, so the evolution. Okay, so I think I think Usman actually just talked about it a little bit, right? Um, he, he was talking about uh, in his time new models, SaaS products, or in the early two thousand multi tenant. You know, so if I look at it, I kind of see three stages, right, of evolution of sales and marketing. There was the first stage in tech sales. I'm talking here, not your B two C, of course. I'm talking B two B in, in technology. But you've had pretty much one buyer, right? One buyer. Uh, maybe a CIO, an IT manager, or, or a director of IT, you would go there with your with your kit and a uh, really sales driven. And it was, hey, I'm going to sell you, you know, IBM mainframe or whatever that might be. Here's the hardware. Here's the product. Go and play with it. Let, let, you know, and and off we go. Um, so that was a real one to one kind of engagement with one buyer. Then we moved in the early 2000s to this kind of you know multi tenant SaaS products coming out, and and it went from okay. MQL, you know, downloads of MQLs to SALs and inside sales, uh, making appointments, and then you send an SE, and then the SE comes with the sales guy to agree the commercial framework, and then we send them something nice because they've become a customer. So real linear buying process. Um, and, you know, it's not a linear buying process anymore, and I think it's driven by multiple buying centers. It's driven by um, users testing, trying, interacting with your product, um, so again, the speed of that, you know, people coming to you because they're able to understand what your product is. They've probably done more research than you on the product. They've read blogs, they've spoken to in industry experts. So the days of kind of meeting one person, selling to one person who does their due diligence with an analyst have pretty much gone, right? There's multiple analysts, there's multiple buying centers. Um, and, and the sales has got more sophisticated in some ways for, for marketing and salespeople. And I feel, you know, a couple of things have happened there. I think marketeers have started to appreciate the sales process more because you can have people who just test your product and subscribe and buy it, right? And if they like it, they continue to renew um, or subscribe. And then you have salespeople who are became, becoming more marketeers. They're interested in their own brands. They're putting out marketing content. They're influencing uh, the marketing process. Um, so I think... I think there's an evolution that the two pieces have come together closer. Um, and as you know, end users are driving a new buying behavior similar to B2C, um, you can see marketing having a more important role right, in that process, especially when it's test a product straight to revenue rather than the multiple steps I described before. So I think, I think it's a fun evolution. I think we're all learning um, in that process. Um, and I think, you know, it, it's nice to, to sit with your sales leader or, or sales partner um, and talk to them about marketing tactics and techniques and, and how things are changing. And similarly, you know, for, for me to learn from around the sales process. So um, I think, yeah, I think we're in that third evolution, right? Going from from one-to-one -one sales to SaaS and, and multi-tenant. And now we're moving to this kind of end-user driven, um, you know, really, if they like the product, they continue with it. So that's how I would talk about the three kind of stages of evolution. Yeah. Kabil, I'll, um, I've been in the B2B industry related to sales, marketing, business development for almost 30 years now. And one thing that has consistently stayed there is how do we engage clients and prospects early in their decision cycle, right? And that gap, you know, from a marketing perspective, one of the core objectives of marketing is to be able to create that understanding so that the customer automatically or the prospect automatically comes to the decision that this is the vendor and these are the questions that I need to ask. So the, the, the need to be able to move up early into that influence cycle, I would call it, the stage of influence is very important. And, and, and the evolution I would describe, and, you know, your point is absolutely valid, you know, that today uh, clients are more knowledgeable than the, the sellers are, 
right? The, pro the buyer is more knowledgeable. They've done research, mm -hmm. they've talked to multiple vendors, they've formulated opinions, they've engaged analysts to look at solutions for them. And they have now come in with very, very well equipped in-depth information. And that's kind of now, and they're engaging later and later. They've already made up their mind. So, so that chasm is, I, that's where the evolution really is, it has to focus, right? And so Absolutely. one of the things that has happened, and we see this with the, with, with, you know, social, social networks like LinkedIn is that selling has focused on being able to build the network, the connection. I know Kabil, Kabil knows John, John knows Jane, Jane knows that, right? And it's the network effect that we've been relying on, right? But when you yeah. know, but now we've also been around enough that we know that people have so many connections, but very little of them actually translate into actions or can translate into actions, right? So there's a yeah. lot of false positives that actually show up when I look at a at a connection that who could connect me to this person. There'll be a lot of false positives because they're just like, "Hey, would you be my connection? Yes, I'll be a connection." Now, with the shift. Yeah. That is transit that is taking place is now you have to become a thought leader, right? So in the context of B2B, what that means is that the seller, the salesperson, has to be able to guide, has to be a solution partner, a solutioning partner for their clients, right? So they have to be able to uh, explain and help them go through the process, the decision. In order to do that, Kabil. We have to build that trusted relation, that interpersonal aspect keeps coming up over and over again. That's really important because I will only listen to people I find credible, I find truthful, right? Secondly, yes. I will only listen to conversations. This is a very interesting point, super, super interesting. I will only listen to conversations that are for today, right? I'm a chief security officer. Honestly, I'm concerned about today and tomorrow not about yesterday because that already happened. So yeah. I need to know what's happening. And this is where the conundrum for marketeers comes up, which is that every time I finish creating a final piece of content, guess what? It's old, it's obsolete yes. at birth, right? Because the conversation, especially in our industries, which are so rapidly evolving because of AI, because of transformation, because of digital things because of technolo technology evolutions where things are changing so fast, we have to, we cannot afford to be not in the current conversation. So new tools are required to help people form connections be and become thought leaders, earn the trust and therefore be able to get into the sales cycle. And we see this. Um, you guys have given us great opportunities. You know, we've had an opportunity to engage with your great sales teams. And, you know, the uptake that's taken place and how often they're using, you see those numbers as well as we do, um, is very encouraging that, you know, and it's our, our further proof points that, that the modern seller is interested in intelligence that can be, as you said, synthesized for them and brought into actionable usage. Help me engage a person, right? Kabil, if, if you're a dominant person and I start pinging you with a lot of detailed information and you're somebody who consumes, you know, information in, in small chunks, I am absolutely not just even communicating to you. I have just shut you off by just sending you the wrong set of information. So one safe bet is that we need to be able to start the conversation about today, today, and leverage the collateral and the content that has been created and bring it into today's conversation. And that's one of, as you know, one of the key capabilities that our platform kind of thinks through this. And that's what we've built into XIQ is that not only do you need to understand who the person is and who the buyer is and what's, what are the forces of change that are driving that buyer, mergers and acquisitions, changes in leadership, new victories, new deals, new awards. Those are the things that are shaping B2B today. And Lastly, I need to have something to say on a consistent basis. I need to be relevant, right? So I need to be in today's conversation today. That would be what I would say are, are kind of massive forces, I think, that are, are, are really changing the, the landscape. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think I think some of the things you touched on there. I mean, you know, that's one of the things that drew us to your to your solution, right? Because building this ideal customer profile and, and seeing what they're doing in Marketo and, and what domains people are visiting and all that kind of stuff, that's great insight and intelligence and it's been around for probably a decade now, right? I feel the, the, the key now is how do you target real individuals, right? How, how do you do that? And, and, and it's not just doing a mail merge and sending out the same content to everyone and changing it to Hi John and, and Dear Henry and, and things like that, right? I feel... I feel that's the differentiation, like people sending them real syndicated content that's coming from different thought leaders and, and really starting to position stuff that's not always love my product, love me, love my company. It's more, we want to help you. And, and that's one thing Nutanix, you know, that's one of the reasons we came about. It was, it was to help solve some of the problems in the data center, right? And it was, it was formed um, through a place of empathy because our founders had lived and breathed that. So when we, when we want to understand what customers and people are going through, that's exactly why um, I felt the XIQ platform gives us a, a level of depth and intelligence that you can't really get um, anywhere else. So I haven't seen that level of intelligence. So, um, so yeah, I, 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 feel, I feel that's one of the reasons why we work very closely with you guys, right? Um, and, and it's the same... In, in the relationship that you have with us, because you talked about thought leader, right? And you talked about giving us what's coming next. And as marketeers, we want to know what's coming next, right? Is it, you know, whatever that might be, is it kind of digital footprints or, you know, things that have happened in the past? Is it business intelligence, you know? And I think that's something very powerful as well. You know, working with you guys is really understanding what are you seeing from other leading marketers that we can adopt, whether that's B2C. And we see a lot of stuff happening in B2C that we're bringing into the B2B world now because of the change of the buying patterns, right? Um, so yeah, I couldn't agree with you more on that as well. Well, thank you. And Kabil, I think um, your last few sentences there again, drive perfectly into the next question is, can you tell some of our listeners and audience today how Nutanix specifically is using XIQ? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, of course. Um, I get this. There's three or four, four different yeah, elements. Can you open the first one, please, if you don't mind. Okay. Sorry, Isma. No, no. I was just helping. Okay. Yeah. There we go. Sure. Um, yeah. So. Um, oh, thank you. Okay. So. Um, yeah. You. We have. Um, we use you for real insight and intelligence, both at the account level, right? Um, and one of the things I love about this subscription-based product that allows you to do this at scale is I don't have to pay. You know, for someone to sit at the desk and do this research in the traditional way, right? Scroll, scrolling the internet and putting this information together. I can get real-time information on organizations that I'm interested in on an application. So I can know what's happening with a Procter & Gamble or a HSBC and what the updates are in the market all in one interface, which is really useful. And then if I want to go to that next level, right? Okay, now I want to target someone within that organization um, and understand, you know, who they are, what they're interested in, what their profile's like, what kind of imagery would they relate to? That's what really helps us benefit and improve our targeting. It then allows me to take that and use a creative element to scale a campaign very quickly, right? I can go into uh, a campaign design and I can start sending that person information across multiple channels, utilizing not just our own content, but using third party content. So I can go to places, if it's um, a CISO, I can go to different cyber security. If I'm targeting a CFO who might be interested in, in, in The Economist, I can pull articles right across the web, pull them into one user interface and start to send content, which isn't just why you should love my company, but what's happening in your industry. So differentiating you from marketing noise, I call it, right? or Wombat marketing as it's known, you know, wasted on mugs, bats, and t-shirts. And it's really about content that supports the person that you're targeting, right? How you can really help them. And then the pieces after that are really, you know, third party intent, I think everyone knows about. You go to a domain, you understand what people are looking at. One of the other differentiators for us is that first party intent. You know, are these people using this content? How long are they engaging with it? Are they sharing it with people across their business and who those people are? So it gives us a, a way, you know, to do some of the key components of marketing. Um, and I feel, I feel for me, you know, uh, 
CMO I work for who, who, who's absolutely awesome, a gentleman called Howard Ting, he used to talk about five aspects of a marketer. He used to say, you have to be a data analyst, right? You have to be an architect. You have to be creative. You have to have empathy and be a storyteller. Well, those first three are bundled into this platform. And that's what allows me to send someone a meaningful piece of content in a platform that they want it or in a way they want it in a format they want to conceive it in, right? So I feel that's helped us. Our sellers are happy and, and our field marketing organization um, also utilize this technology um, and the feedback's been very good, right? The hit rate on this, like a 90% accuracy when you can pull anyone into this system and spit out a personal personality profile is, is very powerful. Um, and, you know, I've seen other ABM providers in this space charge me a lot of money for this. And this isn't a reason for you to increase your subscription as much, right? This is, let's keep the cost down. But I feel this is, this is you know, it's beautiful. It's, it's subscription-based. So when we talked about the evolution of the purchasing decision and the buyer being uh, empowered, this is exactly what this does. If I'm not happy with it, I come out of it, right? So this is something that... Um, is benefiting us and I'm, I'm looking forward to that next evolution right i'm looking forward to what you're cooking in the background um because like you said speed to market change of technology is constant engineering velocity is constant so i'm looking forward to the next rev of this so i hope that gave a, a good flavor of how we're using it um and yeah i'm a big fan of the tech and uh, i'm looking forward to collaborating more on it thank you very much and kabil first of all i'd like to thank you and um, Nutanix for giving us the opportunity to showcase what we very passionately believe to be a game changer. And, um, and you highlighted some of the points. Let me kind of, from our perspective, what we have done is we've broken down that buyer's journey into three stages. One, helping frontline people establish that relationship, that personal brand, understand, you know, and use personality insights, which are like a roadmap to how people make decisions. And by understanding in the absence of that physical meeting, in the absence of being face to face, being able to understand how people make decisions, especially when there are buyer groups involved can be a big differentiator. And that's why there's a lot of user adoption in, in, in your organization, for example. Yeah. Second, we have kept in mind that today's conversation requires today's content. And yes, your marketing content is extremely valuable and it comes in, but you've got to place it in today's conversation. And so our platform helps do that. And teams are building industry focused verticals, uh, vertical uh, based campaigns, content together so that they can stay in today's conversation today and they leverage Nutanix content. And then I think what has been extremely insightful to these individuals that are sales leaders is the ability to understand who, from which company, and what is of interest to these people, and then again, how to engage them. I think these are the three major components. And the next I would also like to say is the fact, you mentioned speed to market. So with speed to market, you, can, you may be able to do this across a lot of pockmarked solutions, but having it all in one, as you said, in a subscriber, based kind of system where it's one integrated so you can run the whole loop and you will continuously run you know you know the value as a b2b marketer you know the value of iterative design right that yeah, you run campaigns you get feedback you modify you run again you get feedback that's how you kind of build the relationships right you keep hitting our engine based that feedback loop has to be quick and the turnaround loop has to be fast because we're living at a time where ADD is prevalent. We don't have time to wait for long drawn stuff to come out. Today's conversation today, and then bringing individuals into that conversation kind of personalizes it. And, yeah. and then the impact Kabil would be at the, the cost. It's not just the dollars and cents cost of the subscription. It's the overarching cost of time to market, time to opportunity, time to deal. Right. That's really the big stuff. I think. Well, yeah. Yeah. I think on, on that and, you know, you having been at SAP, you know, there's this there's ABM, which is a, another thing, which is actually activity based management or activity based costing. And I feel you're absolutely right. The time you spend on this and the other piece I would say 
is not only the time you spend on it, but it's similar to, to Nutanix in a way where we have, you know, we bring networking, compute and storage together. So we bring three elements together, we converge them. So if you have a challenge around any of them, you come to us. Here, if I have a challenge around my account insight, my personality insight, my content creation and my execution platform, it's in one place, right? So it helps me not have to stitch together different components. So um, I think they call it one throat to choke, I think, <laughs> on the US. But, you know, that that is also um, something that makes it easier for me, right? Um, which I would like to mention, yeah. Right. Lois, I think we're running out of time. This is going really, really good conversation, but maybe we address a few questions that have come through. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, Kapil and Asman, for your practical insights. That was a stimulating Pleasure. discussion. Uh, okay, everyone, the floor is now open for questions. You can use the Q&A chat box appearing on your screens to post your queries. We have received a few, let's begin. Um, Kabil, I think this one's for you. Vivek is asking that he would like to hear from a UAE perspective, how changes in the B2B buying behavior as a result of COVID-19 and how could AI-led marketing could be a game changer? Oh, that's, a, that's a good question. <laughs> um, thank you, Vivek, for that. So um, specifically in the UAE market, I think, I think when I look at it, and obviously in a worldwide role, you, you look across APJ, EMEA, and the Middle East, I feel the challenges are similar. Right. I feel everyone's going through this disruption and change right now. Um, and I think we can all learn from one another, which is how do we take, how do we make sure we're optimizing our online efforts, right? Online's always been a huge thing. People are in their phones, people are always connected. But how do we use that now to understand our buyers, you know, better? How do we take that intelligence of where they're going and what they're doing and really understand where, what kind of sites and things they're looking at within the UAE, right? And then how do we use something like XIQ to understand those individuals? I don't think it's, I don't think AI is differentiated to that element, like country specific. There are some specifics and, and I'll give you an example, right? So obviously in, in Germany, they use something else to what they use in, in the US around LinkedIn. So they have LinkedIn, but they have a different version. Um, and in Japan and, and, and things like that, there's different networking tools and different sites that people visit. Um, but I feel that I feel the challenge is the same. I feel the challenge is there's a lot of people online, there's a lot of content thrown at them. It's all about how do you differentiate, make your stuff, you know, relevant and accessible. I don't think that change is dependent on where you are. Um, I have to say in the UAE, the, the, I mean, it's, it's with everything that's going on, some of the, some of the, um, you know, the drive and, and getting people still, you know, being able to go in the office, the testing, everything's been really fantastically handled. So there is still a blind element of marketing, uh, which is great to see. And I'm hoping that has, starts to happen in other places. Okay, thank you, Kabul. Um, so the next one, I think it could be both for Kabul and Asman. Kevin is asking, with so many changes in the B two B industry right now, what do you feel? What do you both feel are some of the key skills required for marketeers and sellers to succeed now and moving forward? Asman, uh, Asman, you're on mute. Oh, you're on mute. Key skills required for marketers. Um, everybody says empathy. I think persistence um, is is a very key uh, key skill set. I think it's a, a, that is required. But I think more importantly, research, consistent learning. You know, this is um, the new generation. We work with a lot of students um, in professional sales training schools that um, uh, are actually working on next generation technologies there's a generational shift that's occurring uh, in B2B sales and marketing. And some of the key skill sets that would be applicable would be the ability to use these digital channels to break through, come be more innovative, you know, use video, um, use uh, tools like ours to be able to cut through the noise and be able to hone in precision, you know, focus on precision. Uh, overarchingly, I, you know, it, there's a lot of traditional sales principles. You know, they used to teach us that you have two eyes, two ears, one mouth, use them in that order, right? 
So I think that still holds true. You've got to be able to see and ingest a lot, you know, analyze. And today that augmented intelligence offers you the ability to do that and help you. But you have to put it into a plan and you have to be able to be in a position to be able to use these tools effectively and rapidly. And we've kind of lowered the barrier by making them very easy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the only thing I'd add there is, you know, constantly learning, always learning, reading, understanding from other places and, you know, but don't become, you know, don't spend all your time consuming, I would say, right? I mean, a lot of people spend, I probably spend nine hours a day on Netflix just consuming content, but I feel also produce, right? Be a producer, like, like build stuff, try stuff, take risks. Um, and that's, and, and I think when, when Asman talks about, you know, persistent, I, I talk about resilience, especially in the tech world, right? Um, you have to be able, you have to be resilient as a marketeer. You have to believe in what you do. Um, you know, you have some very stressful situations when quarter ends and things like that. So you have to have that inner resilience and you have that, have that ability um, of empathy with your sales teams as well. So I feel always learn. This is a fantastic time to do that. Um, and, you know, craft, you know, really hone your trade. And, and learn different aspects of marketing. Don't, I wouldn't, don't uber specialize in one area, right? I think I talked about five different areas. So, you know, can, are you a, do you do data anal analysis? Can you tell the story? Are you a storyteller, both, you know, in person or whether that's written or through content? Um, can you architect campaigns? Um, are you a team player use, utilizing empathy? And then, you know, do you have a creative aspect to you? And creative doesn't just mean like design some nice, ebooks or whatever that might be creative also means are you creative in your outreach right that there's two elements to it so yeah that's why thank, thank you Pablo um we've got a couple more questions this one's coming in from Jerry he's asking to, sorry if you don't mind let's go to the one from James that one is we don't have much time and I'd rather focus on that one sure okay yeah. Uh, so, Kabu, this one's for you. James is asking, what is your advice on how to build a business case with your executive team to invest in a new technology platform? What's the business case? Mm -hmm. How would you yep. build a business case? What oh, would how would you, how would you yeah, build a business would case? Be your, how would you position something like a new technology in front of your client? Uh, okay. Your management executive team, sorry, the buying group. Okay, sure, sure, sure. I think I think one is research and intelligence and what things are pointing to, right? So do your do your research. Um, I mean, there's no there's no um, rocket science here. You can see that the market is shifting. You can see buying a list of five thousand people and then hitting them with a, a direct mailer isn't isn't really the approach. And can't, probably can't do that in COVID anyway with certain areas locked down. Right. So we know people are already more online. We know that we still sell to individuals. We know that the, the space of time for someone to see some content and actually absorb it is, is down to, I think, 10 seconds. Right. Anything above that and people just switch off. You know, we, we've taken ebooks and white papers down to a to a tweet. So what I would say is research and see how the market is changing and see the trends uh, in the marketplace. And also connect to other people. You know, um, I've used um, my peers sometimes to come in and talk a little bit about what they're doing in their organization, knowledge sharing. So I would go do my research, work out how are we doing things today and how do we optimize that? And that's where I came from. Right? I looked at it and I felt um, there's a different way to do research, you know, desk research where you're paying people by the day to sit there, trawl the internet and build, con uh, build account plans. We can do that in a smarter way, right? There's a smarter way to get insight and intelligence on people. And there's a smarter way to create content at scale and visuals at scale and send it to multiple people. So my, my advice would be, and I'm happy to help if you, if you need a customer reference, uh, James, I think it was. Um, but yeah, I would do your research. Always think about how you can optimize. Um, another uh, great guy I used to work for, another CMO um, at a previous company used to always tell me, you know, if you, it was a little bit cathartic. You would say, fire yourself every three months and think about how you would do something completely different, right? So um, that's something I would I would advise you to 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 do research um, and think of new ways of doing things. Thank you, thank you, uh, guys. We're running out of time, so we got to wrap this up. Jerry, we will be answering your question over email, so we'll be in touch. Okay, so just to wrap up. 
Um, guys, you will receive a recording of the session in your mailboxes within today. Uh, to close off, what we've gathered from today's session is that the paradigm has shifted. It is not a matter of how you should use AI, but when you should use AI, and that time is now. At XIQ, our pedigree is B2B, and we're enabling businesses to deploy the technology that helps them excel and succeed in the new normal. And if you want to learn how to contact uh, us for a 30-minute session and talk to our experts, you can reach out to our sales and marketing strategists by scheduling a consultation on our website. It's called xiqinc.com. And let us provide you with a recipe on how you can leverage XIQ to bolster your sales and marketing for 2021. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone for being here. We appreciate you. And thank you to Usman and Kabil. Thanks for having me, guys. Thanks for listening to me and giving me the time. I appreciate it. Kabil, thank you very much um, for being a client and also for appearing with us. And your great insight and in sharing your wisdom with us today. Thanks a lot. Thank Thanks. You. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye, guys. Till next time.